Thank you for having me. My name is uh, Justin Sensney. I work at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. We've been using GitLab for about two years, and I wanted to give you a perspective on what the project management has looked like for us. We've started using GitLab Core, um, and we're going to start to pilot the GitLab Enterprise Edition. So what I'd like you to kind of walk away with from this is what, in our experience, we've been able to do with GitLab Core, what we weren't able to easily do, but we kind of found ways to sneak those in, and then what you really, really can't do for project management with GitLab Core. So what I'm going to show you is how we use issues, issue lists, Kanban boards, and milestones. We'll show you some workarounds we found that sort of work for epics, burn down charts, and dependent issues. And then we'll show you examples where we'd really like to, for example, assign issues to multiple users and weights on issues. So first, let me tell you a little bit about what the National Institute of Standards Technology is. It's a center that's part of the US Department of Commerce, and it's non-regulatory. What I mean by that is we're not dictating, you know, this is what you need to make your peanut butter out of. These are the, um, this is the way you need to write your software application. We're simply defining what are the standards of secure applications, and we can help you certify to those standards. So for example, um, IT security publication 800-53 that you are probably very familiar with, that specifies the standard NIST peanut butter. No, 800-53, that specifies the good security controls for a typical software application that's storing data in the cloud, but NIST also makes standard peanut butter. What that is, is that is peanut butter that is sent to various peanut butter manufacturers around the US so that they can actually calibrate their instruments so they can trust number of calories, for example, that they think their peanut butter has actually contains that number of calories. That's the kind of thing that NIST does. Uh, what NIST also has, is it, it actually had the first 1950s uh, stored program computer. The, so the first computer where you can actually put um, stored commands into it and then run those commands uh, was established at NIST. They've got about, um, we've got about 5,600 employees at our Gaithersburg location, about 1,000 employees at our Boulder location, and this is how we're using GitLab. We started it in 2017 with about 50 users. Uh, we've now grown up to 1,255 within NIST. And we've got about 2681 projects within NIST. What these are often are these are a combination of new software projects that you know summer students or other people are coming in trying to write some code, or long-term projects that have a lot of history, like time.nist.gov, which stand, which specifies uh, what the exact time is, um, and actually gets broadcast to pretty much everyone's Android and Apple phone. Um, those are the kinds of projects that exist in GitLab, and in many cases, they were originally subversion projects. So we actually find project management to be a good way to transition those people who are more comfortable with subversion um, as a code repository system uh, to come to Git, and specifically GitLab. So from a subversion developer's perspective, we often say, you know, I understand that you really liked the linear commit history that you got with subversion, and I'm sorry that that doesn't really exist in Git in a good way. But what you can do is you can create an issue, and you can tie commits to a particular issue. And so for a lot of people, that becomes the way that they go from subversion to Git, is we tell them you know, this is kind of a good way to start to learn about Git branching. Um, and we can, you can tie your individual commits that you have to an issue within GitLab. So when they do that, um, and when they get, they get used to doing that, we start to see things like this inside of our uh, inside of our GitLab issues. Every time that they mention a commit, that they mention an issue in a particular commit, it shows up within that GitLab issue, which I think works really well. And then once we start to get them to the advanced level, we can say, hey, you're actually, um, you can start to create branches. Um, and as those branches are created, they tie them to issues as well. So as we've introduced GitLab issues to our subversion developers, uh, this is the kind of growth we experienced in um, in GitLab issues specifically. So as people, you know, f at a pretty linear rate were coming into GitLab and learning about Git, they started to actually issue, we've actually seen issues have really taken off. So this is, these are some of the things that we really like GitLab issues for. Um, a particular uh, user of our GitLab issues will create a checklist of things that they need to do in order to get a particular piece of code working. As they're working on it, they can actually use the GUI to check off those pieces, which is pretty nice. And they can also start to provide some kind of documentation around their issue. So if a problem comes up, they can come back to it, um, and they have documentation in there. 
So as this documentation piece has really taken off, we've experienced the similar kind of growth. So again, with just getting people into GitLab, you know, that's been a pretty straight line, but we've started to experience a lot more people specifically going into the, um, the documentation piece of issues. So here's what we really like about issues and what we kind of introduce our new Git users to. The fact that you have documentation, time tracking, due dates, and labels. With documentation, we highlight the fact that you can actually encode, you know, put documents into your GitLab issues and those carry along, you know, as you're, as you're tracking different commits. What's really interesting about that is uh, we also use ServiceNow. So me and Zach are in the IT shop at NIST and we use ServiceNow for a lot of our, um, our tickets uh, that we have to deal with. And we found GitLab is actually where we often want to put the documentation for our ServiceNow tickets, simply because it's a better way to track some of those. We can also do time tracking on how long we're working on issues, and then we can assign due dates to those. And the part that I really think carries over into some more advanced project management features is that you can create these labels at both the group, the subgroup, and the project level um, for your GitLab projects. So when I have a particular project that I'm working on, and I want to look, in this case, I'm in the Div 188 group, the collaboration services uh, subgroup. And I'm actually able to see all of the different issues that are in this particular subgroup. So I'm able to see these are where it says Salesforce um, hash 49. I'm actually able to see those are Salesforce projects that we're working on. And so what's really interesting about this is when we started the project, we really had about four issues per GitLab user. But that's actually been in increasing as people have started to adopt this project management approach. Now we're uh, growing to about seven issues per GitLab user. So I'd mentioned that uh, labels are really what are carrying us over into some of these more advanced project management features and really seeing you know, some of the things we can't do with the GitLab core that we'd like to be able to do with the Enterprise Edition. So with GitLab issues, what I can do is I can make an issue a, for example, that's a Salesforce label um, that I've attached to a particular issue. And that label can exist either at the group, the subgroup, or the project um, level. I highly recommend that if you use GitLab issues right now, that you make your labels occur at the topmost of your project. Because then what you're going to be able to do is you're going to be able to use that label throughout both the group, the subgroup, and the project. So when I do that, if I then click the board button right here, now I can start to see all of the different labels. And as long as these labels exist at the group level, I can put them into particular um, columns. Now these con this Kanban board is basically a combination of all these different columns where each issue has been categorized into one of those columns. So as I have uh, issues that I'm dealing with, as I'm fixing them, I can drag them from to do to doing to closed. Um, and I can start to deal with these issues. I can also see, for example, uh, who, ha who they have been assigned to within NIST. So in this case, I've tried to tell people, and this is another thing that if you are getting started with this, I highly recommend um, on your own server, tell your users to set their display name to something useful. So where it says at JSS7 at the very end, if someone tries to search for me um, as at JSS7 and that were my display name, they would not be able to find me. But if I change it to a human readable name, then they can use Justin, they can use Sensony, they can use USTIN, they can use any combination of that and they can start to find me. But with JSS7, they wouldn't be able to easily find me. So I, I highly recommend you have your users do that. So in this case, for example, um, do you see where it says move sw.assurance at nist.gov? I'm able to just drag that from the column that's where it says doing right there to closed. And what that actually does is that if I were to go into that Git, GitLab issue, as I did that, that actually put, um, it tracked in the GitLab issue exactly what happened. It would say label removed by the particular user that was signed in and the time that I did it, which is really nice. So those are Kanban boards which are the way that we often, and we often get our managers to look at uh, issues at NIST. But there's another way that people often like to look at issues, and these are milestones. 
this is a way that um, people can track larger projects. They can basically assign issues to a particular milestone, and then as those issues are completed, the milestone percentage gets towards 100%. So if I look at this slide, I can see these are um, within our Active Directory team. These are issues that people are completing, and as they're closing the issues, that percentage that you see, where it says 85%, 28%, 33%, these are um, the percentage done of these particular issues. The other way that I can look at these, uh, which I think is really nice, is I can see kind of at a top-down level where all of these issues are. So if I drill down into this milestone, in this case I clicked that particular milestones button, I can see where each of the issues are. I can see the ongoing issues and the completed issues. And I can also see them within that issue board as well. So in this case, I was looking at the milestone. In this case, I'm looking at the Kanban board. Now, these are the features that I really like about the core edition, but there are other features that you don't, you specifically do not get with GitLab core. Those are epics, burn down charts, and issue dependencies. Epics are when you have multiple issues, often across multiple teams, and you'd like to collect them into a larger project that you're working on. Burn down charts are when you have a list of issues, like that milestone that I showed you, and you'd like to see a chart of how they're getting completed and whether, if you set a deadline date, um, whether or not you're on track. And then issue dependencies are, I have one issue that can't be really be worked on until another issue gets completed. So what I'm going to show you is the secret code to how you can do some of these uh, with GitLab Core right now. What we in particular do is we use that group and subgroup capability that I showed you, um, where we try and make everyone at NIST as much as possible do a really hierarchical view of you know, what their organization looks like. So for example, if there's a particular division that has a lot of, that has a lot of teams, and then they have a lot of projects within those teams, we tell them, create a, at the group level, create your division. At the subgroup level, create your different teams. And then, at the pro and then you get to the project level. And that way, when you drill up all the way to the group level, you can see all of the issues that, are, that that particular division is dealing with. So that's what we really recommend for doing something like epics. Um, for burn down charts, what we recommend is we kind of, we use milestones to basically create a manual estimate. We create an issue that is basically the burn down chart. And then as people are going through, we can set a deadline date for that particular issue. And then we can mention both that issue and the issue that the user's actually working on in those different commit messages. And we can tell them, you know, let's say for example, uh, we're releasing version three of a particular software. Just include the version three soft, uh, the version three issue within your commit messages. And then finally, issue dependencies. One way that we've done that is we've put the particular issue in the, when you put the issue um, that you're working on in the comment section of another issue, you can also add these group level labels called blocked. Um, and then we basically track the blocked issues as the dependencies. So let's look at what we'd like epics to look like. Um, in this case, we kind of use Kanban boards to sort of emulate them. We can see we have, the, we have that blocked level um, you know, on the far left side, and then we have doing and completed. And, when we, and we can also do something like burn down charts with um, our milestones that I was talking about before. But what I'd really like to show you is what gitlab.org can do. So this is what a burn down chart should look like. Um, and while we'd like to get to that, we're not at that today. Um, but that is what we think will happen is we'll be sort of piloting um, the premium edition, which includes some of these features to test them out. And then with dependent issues, I, I just wanted to show you what you can do. You can actually, in this case, what I did is I'm working in a particular issue. Um, in, this, in this case, the Division 188 group, the Collaboration Services subgroup, the Google Analytics project. I have an issue already, um, which was issue number one for this project. When I tag it inside of my description, I can see uh, what that particular GitLab issue might be. So um, before I go further, does anyone have any questions about these three different features that while we don't have access to today, we've kind of created a sort of proxy for um, of epics, burn down charts, and issue dependencies? Yes, that's OK. Uh, so would the group subgroup idea work if different members of the same team couldn't access the same projects? So if I need to be able to access a project that my team member can't? It's a really good point. In that case, I don't think it would. What I usually recommend is 
you know, if someone's a member of a division, that you add them at the division level because then their permissions basically propagate downwards. Um, if I have a project that's a little bit more closed, you know, I only want particular members of a team to access it, then I usually create it as its own, you know, its own um, group. And then I put that project in there. That's a very good question. Yes? I just want to make sure for, you, for everyone who's participating that the notion of epics and burn downs and issue dependencies are supported, but they're supported in the higher edition, paid edition, enterprise editions. And I just want to make sure that's clear so people don't walk out of here thinking that point. those functions do not exist. And that's, that's why I wanted to show what burn down charts look like on gitlab.org, because that is something we definitely see ourselves using. Um, that's, that's a very good point. Do you yes. need a PIV, uh, access? Yes, so we, what we've actually implemented is a single sign, SAML single sign-on, um, so that if users are signed into their computer, they can get in. Um, but we also support having people enter their username and password. That's fine. Um, but very good question. Yes. Um, from a project management standpoint, are you guys looking at risks or uh, requirements for certain projects, or are you just looking at issues? Um, there are different groups that are looking at risks and requirements. Um, I'm not as familiar with exactly how they're doing that, though. Um, but we, I, I do often see, so people are creating user stories, for example, as GitLab issues. Um, so I imagine they're also creating requirements as issues as well. Um, risks, I have actually also seen them creating, they're basically using GitLab issues um, for all of those. Between you know risk requirements or an issue, uh, we do do that at the label level. So we basically assign a label of what it what it is in particular. What I really like about the way these issues work are I can actually search by. So when I put anything into that search term, I can search by at label and then any label. But I can also search uh, the full text of an issue. If anywhere within an issue a particular piece of text comes out, it will show up within this board. So for example, I can have people. They can search by, say, vulnerability. And even if it's within the text of that issue, um, those vulnerabilities will come up. So that's, that's how I do that. Yes. So your labels are going to be arbitrary in the sense that someone could choose it to, it could be sloppy and, and miss them, though, no? I mean. Um, well, so that's why I recommend creating labels at the group level, um, simply because then it's, you know, sort of, there's usually someone at that group level that's seeing all of those. If someone decides to create a label at the project or the subgroup level, um, from the group level perspective, it doesn't really show up. You know. I was thinking about it more from the point of view of the issue creator, so that the issue creator needs to be able to, la to remember to label their thing correctly, Yes. which is a problem. Yeah, yeah, so that's really a good, you know, the project manager and the issue creator you know, need to get together to decide kind of how they'd like to label. Um, and. And that's why I say at the group level, if you keep the labels at the group level, it's, um, it's pretty easy to do. If, you, if someone accidentally creates it at a lower level, it's actually also easy to promote those labels. So there's a button in GitLab you can push that's promote to group label, promote to subgroup label as well. Um, so I wanted to show you, this is kind of what it's turned into. Um, we now have all these different groups at NIST, um, and this is kind of how they're collaborating. The size of the bubble is basically how many projects they have in GitLab, and the strength of the arrow is basically how many people are collaborating um, from one project to another within, uh, within those labs. So ITL, Information Technology Laboratory, CTL, Communications Technology Laboratory. Um, so this is just, again, kind of my advice for what you can do. Um, again, like Div 188, Board, that's that Kanban board that exists at the group level. The collaboration services board is at the subgroup level. And then just a reminder, this is kind of what our experience has been um, and sort of why we're moving from GitLab core to testing out some of those paid versions. Um, in particular, we've really extensively used issues, issue lists, Kanban boards, and milestones. Um, and we found slight workarounds for epics, uh, burn down charts, and dependent issues. Um, but we do you know, what we're really looking for is assigning issues to multiple users and waiting issues. And that was kind of our, that's sort of how we made the decision of once we got there, we realized, you know, we really should test out some of the paid features. 
Um, so I did want to mention this is my email address, and as a government employee, I can't endorse commercial products. So I'm really here just to tell you, you know, this is how we used GitLab, and we liked GitLab, but I'm not instructing you to use GitLab. <laughs> so. So with, with Git, um, pure Git, and these, I would say, features that GitLab layers on top, does these features check in the issues into Git as a, uh, some kind of item, and then that gets updated somehow, or how is it stored on the back end of, it of is, the repository? It is definitely one of my questions to the Git, Git lab developers, I can ans at least answer for the documentation part, like the wiki of a Git lab project, that actually does get stored as its own Git repository, uh, which is really interesting to see on the back end. So, so I don't know if the Git lab people may yeah. know a little bit more so about the, that. The issues, oh, yeah, the issues are not stored in the Git repository. Okay. Uh, they're stored in the Redis database. Uh, um, and uh, they're, they're sort of meta objects on top of the Git repository, right? Okay, so, 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 so the reason I'm asking is that we have a, two networks, like an internal network and an external network. The internal network, we have a, a, a GitLab, and outside we have uh, the AWS. Um, if we have issues created in GitLab, and I pipe them over into the AWS side, um, I don't know if I would see them because they are not like an item or a thing in a rep, uh, repo. More so is if I have a GitLab outside, can I pipe those issues from the inside out to the other GitLab? So I have two instances, one inside, one outside, and I'm asking about the synchronization between the two. So we have a couple of options to do that. Uh, yeah. So with regards to the AWS, I'm not sure if that's going to be easy because um, the issues would have to be exported out into like a flat file of some sort and then imported into the AWS environment. Mm -hmm. But if you're using both uh, GitLab instances on both sides, yeah. um, there is the geo uh, functionality that we do have available where the, the repository can get mirrored as well as uh, stuff that goes with the project gets mirrored with it. Um, then there is another set of functionality that if, if they're completely disconnected networks, let's say it's a, some sort of an air gap network where you cannot, like you have to sneaker net it in some way. Um, we, we just did this for an intelligence community customer where we've we've kind of solved that where it goes from a low side network to a high side network yeah. um, by putting the stuff, so it extracts everything out into a f flat file-ish format, um, which then gets picked up automatically in the high side and then gets that's, uh, reintegrated into GitLab. So people see the same data across both networks. Okay, okay is that the answer? Yeah. Um, the one, one follow-up question is, with that uh, sneaker net design, um, is, is it just then exporting it and re-importing it, or can I fully automate both sides of that? Yeah, so the import and export processes can be automated, okay. right? But it, again, it's, a, it's not because of the sneaker net part of it, mm -hmm. it's a timing question. Yeah. So you kind of have to schedule it accordingly and say, okay, at 7 a.m. it's going to export everything out, and then there's some way that it's going to travel on the sneaker net path mm -hmm. or through an S3 bucket or some method that you decide is, is appropriate for your security posture to get to the other side. And then at, say, 10 a.m. it's going to look for that. If it finds it, great. great. If it doesn't find it, it will rerun the job you know, 15 minutes later or every, every so often and pick it up because we do have scheduling capability within GitLab to be able to do that sort of stuff. Okay. Thank you. Samir, would you also say this is a good example of the Git, or good use case for the GitLab rake command? 
Uh, yes. Um, there, uh, what was the comment? Is, is this a good example of the Git, uh, Git, uh, GitLab rake command? And the answer is yes. Um, specifically, we can, I mean, there are many options, like, and uh, one of the options is to do the rake command to do the, the sort of uh, migration, if you will, of data across uh, instances. Yes. Any other questions? Go ahead, a question. So, Justin, with respect to the things that GitLab can't do today, have you submitted issues to GitLab to request that functionality? Well, again, these are these are things GitLab can do. Um, they are just uh, things that can be done in the paid version. So, I can, if I with the Enterprise Edition, I can assign issues to multiple users. And I can also put weights on issues. Okay. And if you go to GitLab.org, you can see you actually can do those things. Okay. But with my internal GitLab core that I've installed, I okay. can't do those things. Um, and then Epic's burn down charts dependent issues, those are things that, you know, they exist explicitly in, on GitLab.org. They just don't exist on my installed core edition. And we've kind of, we found workarounds for those. Um, but once we get to the, the ones at the very bottom, that's when we said we really should you know, for, so basically, the way we're doing it is for that, those about 1,200 or so users that we have, we're leaving them in the core edition, and then we're saying, hey, when you want these, we also have a paid edition uh, you can go to. So that's, that's how we're doing that. Yes. You mentioned stuff version earlier. Um, what did your development pipeline look like? What tool set did you have prior to, and what was your incentive to migrate? Our main incentive to migrate was actually the fact that we didn't have a good uh, CI/CD pipeline integrated with Subversion, um, and so we actually went to we tried GitLab in combination with Jenkins, but then we found it just made more sense to use GitLab with its own CI/CD pipeline. But that was our that was our main motivation. Um, very good question. Any others? Justin, thank you very much. Thank you.